tuppen here. Will never happen again. Rwanda marks 25 years since the worst genocide in the country's history by commemorating the lives of 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. The three-month killing spree began in April of 1994, about a tenth of the country wiped out. Decades later, generations of Rwandans bear the scars of the country's dark past, but they've also vowed to rebuild and rise again. Rwanda today is politically stable and economically strong. President Paul Kagame is largely credited with the country's transformation. However, some critics view Kagame as an authoritarian leader with an intolerance for dissent. As Rwanda remembers its past and looks to its future, we talk to a genocide survivor whose story of heroism in the face of unspeakable tragedy was immortalized in the Oscar-nominated film Hotel Rwanda. Paul Rusesa Bagina is the founder of the Hotel Rwanda Rusesa Bagina Foundation, and he joins us now from Brussels. Paul, great to have you back on the show. It's a pleasure, sir. If we look back 25 years ago, 800,000 people killed in Rwanda, and we saw President Paul Kagame at the uh, beginning of the show there. He said that the country is wounded and still heartbroken, but in many ways it remains unvanquished. You were there at the center of the carnage. Uh, we saw the movie Hotel Rwanda. You saved lives. What are your feelings today, 25 years later? It is too unfortunate to tell you, to tell the audience, that uh, 25 years later, a lot of things have never changed. In 1994, we were in a war which had started in 1990, and that massacres had started already since 1990. So actually, the genocide was a climax the climax of the mass massacres. So about in a period of three months, 90, day, 90 days, between April 6th and July 4th, 1994, an average of about 800,000 uh, uh, people were killed, Hutus and Tutsis, all confused, were killed. In the end, you know, in the end of a war, there is always a winner and a loser. So the winner won the war, and also after the aftermath, in, you know, in 1996, since October, the same winner, the today's Rwandan leadership led by President Paul Kagame, crossed the border, went to the today's Congo, massacred about 300,000 Rwandan refugees, Hutu refugees, this time. So. Even today, many people are disappearing. And Paul, what is at the root of this enmity, this hostility between the Tutsis and the Hutus? Well, this sometimes we tend to condemn colonizers. But when colonizers came in, we were already divided. There was, there was a, a kind of um, a lord and a, a, lord and a, and a, a slave. There was a boss and with his workers who were not paid. That was kind of slavery before colonization. So it started long in our history. And colonizers, when they came in, they made it worse. By 19, around 1933, when we were under the then Belgian, the kind of, um, we were under, under the UN, but Belgium was controlling us under you know, for the under a mandate a special mandate so they are the ones who gave us our first identity cards giving our first identity cards they took to this to be also to be much more intelligent much more clever much smarter than hutus taller closer to europeans closer to whites this was also a mistake but the divide and rule was already there. Paul, uh, I'm going to get to your story, your personal story and involvement in this genocide. Uh, 
Your story, of course, as I pointed out, was memorialized in that movie, Hotel Rwanda. It's a harrowing story, but when you were there at the hotel, when you were giving refuge to the people who came to the hotel to seek protection from uh, these mobs that were on the streets, um, did you fear for your own life? Did you ever think that you may not get out of their life? You know, at the beginning, you're always, always, always you're afraid. On April 9th, when I was just evacuated from my house and given a gun to kill my wife, children, and everybody I had in the car, we were about 34 people in two cars, in two different cars. I had a mi cars, I had a minibus. My neighbor has, had also his car, car. We were driving. So that time I was kind of afraid. But as, but as time goes on, as you feel much more responsible, once you sit down and see that there is nobody else to take responsibility, then you engage yourself. This is how actually I got involved in what was going on from the beginning to the end. If you look at the response of the international community at the time, if you look at the response from the United States, at that time President Clinton was president here, uh, he has since expressed a great deal of regret for not acting to stop this genocide. In fact, he said something four years after that in 1998. Let's listen to what he said. We did not act quickly enough after the killing began. We should not have allowed the refugee camps to become safe haven for the killers. We did not immediately call these crimes by their rightful name, genocide. So, Paul, how big a failure was this for the international community? Well, the international community by itself, I believed in it myself. I took a, a, a flight from Brussels with my wife and my younger son. It was on March 30th in the evening from Brussels to Kigali. If would I have known, I wouldn't have taken my wife and my children back to Kigali. When we, b before coming to Belgium, we had fled our house. We were living in the hotel, in the Diplomat Hotel, which is today's K Serena Hotel in Kigali. So I was the general manager in that company for Sabina, for the Sabina account. Therefore, when we arrived in Kigali, we trusted, we put all our trust into the international community, into the United States. We, I told my wife that everybody is there watching. Nobody would kill anyone in front of the international community observers who had even brought in 2,700 soldiers. But when the genocide broke out, when the mass massacres started, they went hiding, and they were the first to be evacuated. Think about a population, like the Rwandan population of 7 million, who had 2,700 soldiers. The United Nations deciding the very first day on the 7th of April to pull out. How do you feel? We felt completely abandoned by the, United, by the United Nations, by the international community as a whole. I heard Mr. President Clinton's speech, his words. His words are so good, but was he not there in 1996, 97, and 1998 when today's Rwandan army, led by President Kagame, as I said previously, crossed the border and killed 300, an average of 300,000 women, well, elderly, old people, the kids, the children, all of the sick people, all of those Hutus who could not run away. Was he, did he regret that? Unfortunately, not yet. Which is also a pity because according to the UN mapping report, if you read it, if this was examined by a competent institution, it would also be taken as another genocide. So, I would wish to understand what President Clinton is saying, but he still has that responsibility, and he never apologized for it. Paul, uh, of course, part of the healing Quinn. process is finding justice. Uh, do you believe that those who were responsible for the massacre 25 years ago, that they have been brought to justice? 
Some of them, yes, because the Hutus who killed Tutsis between April 6th and July 4th, 1994, those ones were brought to justice, all of them, and hundreds of thousands of them were even killed, not sentenced, but killed, just like that. However, as I told you, we had been in a war, Hutus fighting against Tutsis. Now, all of those Tutsis, those Tutsis who won the war, where are they? They are untouchable. How could pre we pretend to do justice without bringing both parties around the table in a face to face, give them, give us, all of us, an opportunity to face each other, to bring the whole truth of what happened to our country to the table, and then discuss it. And then, after discussing, discussing, discussing it, we'll, then justice will be done. And then, the only then, reconciliation will be possible. Right. We can never, it is never possible to reconcile a winner with a gun machine gun, standing straight, and a loser, hands up, yeah. laying down, begging for forgiveness. So do you think it would be, it would help the cause of justice a great deal if you had something like South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission? That is actually, that would be the best solution where you have Hutus and Tutsis just no, no, not necessarily around a table, on a rectangular table, where we will sit just in front of each other, look at each other's face, and then bring that truth there and only there. That is the only way we can reconcile by right. truth and reconciliation, as it happened in South Africa and also in many different countries. Yeah. Paul, if you look at Rwanda today, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you've told me that there are still suspicions between Hutus and Tutsis, but it is now a politically stable country. Its economy has grown. Uh, as I pointed out in, in the introduction, uh, President Paul Kagame has been credited for a lot of that. But what do you make of the country today? I think those ones who say this are the ones who do not know Rwanda. I believe you do not know Rwanda very well. We say that there are two Rwandas. There is Rwanda, the capital city, which is now for those ones who came from outside fighting, took power. And you have the rural areas where 90 percent of Rwandans live. Those people have got, are dying of hunger as we are talking right now. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you again. And uh, thanks again. We need to take a break right now, but the conversation continues with our panel. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.